A first impression can stigmatise anybody. I don't even want to get into what happened when I started a what culture, but let's just say it involves Adam Cleary, a wireless mouse, a life-size cardboard cut out of Titus O'Neil, and it's the reason I'm never allowed in the glass office again. With that in mind, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, and these are 10 wrestlers who f- messed up on their first day. Number 10. Kane doesn't know where the hard camera is. It wasn't his first day, obviously, just his debut under the mask, but that's sort of worse. The build, the look, the occasion, the fire, the strictest definition, awesome sight of this gigantic, terrifying hellspawn removing a door from its hinges with his bare hands. It was one of the all-time great character introductions. But he didn't deliver that first tombstone particularly well. It's no wonder the demented sod isn't fond of masks. I mean, the blighter didn't know where the hard camera was for a few awkward moments there. He got it right, turned around to get it wrong, and then, presumably after The Undertaker barked instructions into his bollocks, he eventually got it right again. Number 9. Edge injures his opponent with a somersault sent on. Edge had the credentials and the training and indeed the stuff, but let's be honest, sometimes things just go awry. Bad sh** just happens. It's life. Edge, debuting as a tortured soul with an industrial rock aesthetic, worked Jose Estrada Jr. The brief match was cut short, though, when he injured his opponent's neck with a somersault sent on. The remorse was etched over his face immediately, but thankfully, he got a second chance and over the course of a glittering career, became one of the best and safest pair of hands in WWE's 21st century era. Number 8. Taz gets over too well. Taz had the audacity to arrive in a promotion that functioned to make money as a ready-made star capable of drawing it. In the warped world of WWE, he messed up on his first day by performing rather well. He was never a fit philosophically. He was short and worked a unique style that looked dangerous when in fact the man knew the precise angle at which to drop his opponents near their heads. Taz debuted at the 2000 Royal Rumble to a mega pop sparked by his hometown town crowd, who went ballistic for a short and explosive exhibition of his deadly-looking suplex game. Angle, always a very selfless and wild bumper, jumped into those arcs with gusto. Too much bloody gusto. Certain backstage powers deemed Taz's work too close to the flame and dampened it almost instantly. Number 7. Kazani wishes he'd ran away to join the circus again. Kazani was another embodiment of a Vince McMahon trend that permeated, or let's be honest, stained the mid to late 2000s. Much like Eugene, the Spirit Squad, and the masochistic Basham brothers, Kazani was an outsized, larger-than-life character that Vince thought was necessary in the wake of a ratings decline he never did arrest. Possibly because Kazani, a greenhorn product of a wildly dysfunctional developmental system, was the drizzling sh- He was in no way ready for TV, but he made his debut against MVP in January 2009 regardless. It started out respectably enough. MVP did much of the early work by bumping big for a pair of over-the-shoulder arm drags, but it started to fall apart and quickly when Kazani undershot a crossbody. Kazani, visibly lost, bumped awkwardly and, well, he telegraphed everything. The commentary euphemisms didn't so much rain as pour. Not sure what that was, but it was effective, Jim Ross said, of an ugly basement drop kick. That's a unique cover if ever I saw one, he said when Kazani made a pin attempt by nestling into MVP's tummy. A soft and dull mess of a debut. He lasted just two months subsequent to it. Number six, Matt Seidel shoots for the stars and, well... It would be generous to state that All Out 2020 was a cursed event. During the Casino Battle Royale, the Floridian humidity proved a problem for the debuting Matt Seidel. Entering the match as the Joker, with no small hint of irony, he sought to make an immediate grandstanding impression by delivering his trademark gorgeous shooting star press to Will Hobbs. Undone by the perspiration that had coated the top turnbuckle, though, he slipped, coming perilously close to landing on his head. But AEW is isn't a spiteful company. He was mocked after the fact, but in a manner that was gentle and a bit inspired. The botch was blamed in storylines on Michael Nakazawa, who, irritated at being left out of the match, oiled up the ropes. They even had a match on Dark to wrap a nice bow around it. Number 5. Sabu defies death as advertised. 
Sabu was such a crazed and enigmatic presence that his frequent botching only added to his lore. This chaotic energy was marketed expertly by Paul Heyman in his Smoke and Mirrors peak as a promoter. Sabu wasn't a botch merchant, he was suicidal, and thus Sabu's inconsistent balance became a feature not a bug. That all flew in ECW, a promotion that embraced the odd fluff note, far better than that sterile, overproduced perfection, but it wasn't what the WWF, even the WWF of 1997, was about. Sabu made a shock appearance on the flagship, Raw, as part of an experimental, uh, let's just see what sticks, invasion angle that never really went anywhere. In a bid to let Sabu do, well, Sabu things, he attempted to dive off the top of the giant R onto members of Team Tag. Weirdly, he seemed to tuck his chin, senton style, missing a rather large target by rather a lot. But that was Sabu for you. He didn't just sh beds, he smeared sh all across in time hotel rooms. Number 4. LA Knight Want to Watch? Eli Drake Needs a Watch. Eli Drake has finally made it to WWE as LA Knight after taking a rather circuitous route. Knight isn't elite in the ring, but he's one hell of a talker on purpose and sometimes accidentally. That range is crucial. He's a cosplay rock without being too cringe about it, which is significantly more of a compliment than it may first seem. LA Knight didn't mess up on his first day. He cut a funny and confident promo at the expense of the NXT broadcast team at TakeOver. Vengeance Day, but Eli Drake definitely did. Years and years ago, in 2008, Drake buried himself at his tryouts by turning up an hour late. This was very ill-advised, especially in those days when WWE's bargaining hand was even stronger in the complete absence of legit competition. WWE was the only place to be. You couldn't turn up late when countless wrestlers weren't even asked to turn up at all. Number 3. The Shockmaster does, in fact, shock the world. He fell flat on his f***ing ass. That is the perfect reaction because, well, he didn't fall flat on his ass. He fell on his face. What's also unbeatable is Sting's big declaration. This was the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia title graphic meme years and years before the show even existed. The Shockmaster shocks the world. Ole Anderson, corpse before doing the Shockmaster's voiceover and the poor prick had to pick up his glittery Stormtrooper helmet as if it was going to save everything before miming it. Just magic for everybody not named Fred Ottman, who obviously, well, f***ed it up by going arse over tit on a skirting board. Only in WCW could one fall over something that 999,999 times out of a million has a solid wall attached to it. Number 2. Public Enemy live up to their name. Reports circulated that Public Enemy gave it the bingen upon arriving in the WWF. This was a no-no. If you arrived from the dreaded outside, you weren't hot sh you were actual sh They arrived late, and per JBL, who recounted the infamous scene that followed on After the Bell with Corey Graves last year, The Undertaker greeted them with a curt, that's lunch, boys. Whether that was his way of burying their timekeeping or not, Bradshaw received it as an instruction to eat them alive. That first impression wasn't helped when Johnny Grunge and Rocco Rock, in self-preservation mode or full of hubris from their ECW glory days, refused to go along with the schedule finish to their match seconds away from the bell. When the bell sounded, a glorified assault unfolded. Imposing business on a team that refused to do it, Bradshaw rained down unrestrained chair shots on Grunge, whilst Farouk, meanwhile, threw Rock to the mat with such force that Rock didn't have time to bump for it. He landed on his elbow before later in a match that never once felt like one, taking a chair shot even Ken Shamrock wouldn't. Number 1. The Warrior drones on more than Triple H in 2003. The Warrior fancied himself as a great talker with lots of profound things to say about the spirit of Warriors and how they can't be destructicized or whatever the hell he was on about. He was fantastic value, talking utter blathering sh for about two minutes, standing in front of that gorgeous blue WWF background, and he was also phenomenal at playing it very sinister, ahead of his ultimate challenge of Hogan at WrestleMania 6. Well, he didn't do a bloody thing to get him over as a babyface successor, but still, 
awesome. The exact time of his infamous debut promo here, though, has taken on a life of its own. Exaggerated into myth by how long it felt like. Between his mystifying talk of epical battles, demise preparations, and inexhaustible truths, he really was thick as pig sh and what's worse, he thought himself clever. He went on for literally 20 plus minutes. This was well over his allotted time, and Nitro had to be rewritten as it was unfolding in real time. Fewer people than you'd think changed the channel during this rambling nonsense, but fewer people than WCW expected returned to watch him the very next week. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. Plus, you can let us know your thoughts on Twitter at What Culture WWE. And while you're there, follow me at Adam Wilborn. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam from What Culture, and I'll see you soon.